Welcome to Focus on Health, a series of educational programs highlighting current health issues sponsored by the School of Nursing at Salisbury University. I'm Dr. Mary DiBartolo, Professor of Nursing at Salisbury University and host of the program. I welcome back Samantha Scott. You are a psychologist yes, um, with the Child and Family Center located here in Salisbury. Yes. And you've been on the program before when we talked mm -hmm. about problems with adolescent mental health, depression, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we decided back then that it would be very appropriate to do a show focusing on the role of social media in that problem. Yes. So talk to us about that. And sure. let's first talk about the prevalence of adolescent mental health issues. Sure. Well, I know when I was here before, we chatted a lot about just how the rates have skyrocketed. Um, so anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, I mean, have more than doubled in the last couple of decades. And what age group exactly would you define adolescent? Um, you know, most of the research kind of defines that between 12 and 18. Uh, in my practice, uh, I see it younger and younger, I think every year. You know, I've been practicing in Salisbury uh, since 2000, 2012, um, and I think every year it gets a little bit younger. So what, what is younger? You're talking 10 or? Mm -hmm. You know, I get kids as young as seven, eight, and nine with horrible anxiety, and it's just a catalyst. Um, you know, anxiety and depression are really highly linked, um, and oftentimes you, when you start off with some of those issues, it snowballs into one or the other. Um, so, you know, by 12, 13, if you've had a number of years of anxiety or depressive symptoms, then you can see those snowball and escalate by adolescence. And isn't there some research evidence to say that some of this can be genetically based? Oh, sure. A lot of this runs in families, um, and uh, especially anxiety and depression, we know that runs in families. There's the long debate of nature versus nurture, but it's probably both. <laughs> Combination of sure. both, mm -hmm. just being in that environment yes. um, mm -hmm. and such. And I know what we want to spend most of our time on, because we know it's a problem, is the impact of social media, yes. which is huge these mm -hmm. days. It's certainly helping escalate these rates. So talk, yes. talk about that. Well, you know, I mean, as these rates have been increasing over the last couple of decades, everyone's looking for reasons why. Um, and social media seems to coincide, you know, the birth of social media and technology and uh, all things that start with I, iPhones, iPads. Um, so as, as that's increased, we're seeing all of the rates of anxiety and depression and um, self-injury and things like that increasing. And we're just now starting to have some clear data drawing causal links, you know, for a long time. It, everyone says, well, we know this has to be an issue, but we haven't had enough data or enough time to have studied it over time to know. Uh, but there is some research uh, coming out here lately that's starting to show direct links, especially with the amount of time spent on social media and relating that to depression and loneliness and things like that. Well, there's been so much um, on TV programs and such about mm -hmm. kids taking their phones to bed, um, not sure. sleeping properly, and just sure. exciting their brains. So I know mm -hmm. you wanted to get into some of the physical consequences, mm -hmm. and then we'll spend some amount of time on the emotional consequences. Sure. Um, so, yes. So kids, I mean... You know, kids are, uh, we say addicted, <laughs> and by that I mean it, it's hard to find a teenager who doesn't have a phone in their hand or <laughs> um, who's looking at social media for hours a day. Um, and what happens is a lot of these kids, like you said, they're taking them to bed. They have them near them all night long. Uh, you and I know the little ding when we get a message. That ding is just as important to them. They're waking up throughout the night whenever they hear that. Um, there's plenty of research on even the, the light emitted by certain technologies. It's messing up melatonin, which is going to interrupt your sleep cycles. So you've got kids staying up way later because they're online and looking up things and chatting and, and doing different things online. Uh, and then just physically not letting their brains rest to get into a good deep sleep throughout the night. Yeah, you mentioned the ding. I think there was a research study that mm -hmm. came out about how that's linked to dopamine release mm -hmm. and sure. so forth. Yep. So it, it's, it yes. is an addictive thing. It is. And we ha yes, we have that research that shows every time you get that message or you get a like on Facebook, it elicits pleasure centers in your brain just like uh, a, a drug does. So I guess it gets down to, we'll, we'll get to this, is about the self-esteem mm -hmm. and the likes and, sure. and then of course the, the whole issue with cyberbullying, sure. the, the really negative side. But let's first start with, you know, what are some of the more frequently used 
uh, social media yeah. apps that are linked to some of these problems. Yeah, I mean, I think most of the research currently is on apps like um, Instagram and Snapchat. Those are probably the two I see most often used by teenagers. Um, you may have even heard of Snapchat streaks which is a very big deal to teenagers these days. So you have different people that you communicate with on Snapchat um, and you get a streak by communicating with them every day. And then if you break that streak, uh, it, in their world it can be devastating for a friendship. <laughs> so you have kids who, um, you know, I have, I've had kids who have had to have surgery and will have someone run their Snapchat so they can maintain their streaks for the few days that they're not going to be online. <laughs> Oh you want to talk about addiction. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> um, and self-esteem is tied into all of these things. So, you know, with us older people on Facebook, you know, we like when people like our pictures. You can multiply that probably by 10 uh, when you have a snap, Snapchat streak that is maintained or people like your pictures on Instagram and things like that. I was unaware of that. <laughs> of course, I it have kids that are much deal. older. It yeah, the, the teenage years have been quite a while since I've dealt with that. And of course, it was much less complicated, you know, back when I had teenagers. Right. But um, so, what are some of the emotional impacts then? Right. You're, you already mentioned the right. self esteem. Sure. Well, and to some extent, I mean, uh, social media is not all bad. Um, and technology is not all bad. You know, obviously, there's lots of great advances that we're having because we have quick access to information. Um, and just like alcohol and drugs, people do things because they are rewarding. Uh, so social media can have a lot of positive effects. You know, for some people, it can increase self-esteem. You know, you get those likes and you have friends, and that makes you feel good about yourself. Um, for a lot of the kids I see, I, I think the internet and social media can be an outlet. It can be a place where they can be a different person maybe than they are, you know, in the real world or at school. They can gain information about things about themselves that they might be embarrassed to seek from adults and, and peers. Um, so you see a lot of identity exploration online, which in some ways can be healthy. Of course, you have to, um, you know, everything is healthy when it's in moderation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest challenges with the online world is there's no, um, unless you've got parents who are really monitoring everything, you just have access to everything. And for a lot of kids, it's access to way more than they need to know. <laughs> I can see that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so talk a little bit too about the cyberbullying. That's a really big downside to this. Sure. Well, and you know, we talk a lot about bullying. Bullying's been a hot topic issue for a lot of years now. When you get online, it, it's different. Um, one of the biggest things I see is exclusion. So, you know, even in my 30s and on Facebook, there are times when I see my friends who have gone out to dinner and I go, oh, well, I wasn't invited, <laughs> you yeah. know, and it stings a little bit. <laughs> um, for kids who their entire world is wrapped up in being accepted, it is a very easy place to feel left out. Um, and I think a lot of kids do this on purpose. They're, you know, they're posting pictures of hanging out with friends and all the great things they're doing. And if you weren't invited in that, um, you know, the little sting that I might feel like, again, I think is tenfold for a teenager who's trying to feel accepted in a group. Um, also online, you know, the cyberbullying is way easier to be mean. <laughs> you know, a lot of things get said online that people would never say to someone's face. Right. And so you have much more harsh words that are shared between kids um, and very hurtful, hurtful things that are said. I don't know. I grew up in a time when <laughs> people got bullied all the time. It, obviously, right. social media wasn't around and it was just kind of an accepted thing right. of, of growing up, right. but I guess it can go far. And, and I know when we um, did our last program, you talked about cases where the bullying was so excessive and we see these, see these issues on the news mm -hmm. where it leads yes. to suicide, which right. is... It's terrible. And the thing with social media is these kids don't ever get a break. So, you know, like we said, when we were in school, kids were mean. Kids have always been mean. Um, but at 3 o'clock, you left and you went home. Hopefully, you got to go home to a supportive family or to a sport or something else that was positive for you. These kids leave the doors of school, and they're right online. Uh, so it just never ends. And so if it's a negative experience, now you have 24 hours a day of negative um, 
it, bullying or negative information you're taking in, uh, their brains just never get a break. Okay, so shall we move on and talk about um, how we can address this issue? And I guess a lot of it falls into the laps of parents. Yes. Um, and I know you wanted to talk about uh, monitoring, um, somehow how can they control mm -hmm. uh, use, and then being proactive in terms yeah. of teaching and so forth. So sure. let's start first with monitoring. Okay. Um, you know, in my practice, I see a lot of teenagers, and I, I try to be as cool as I can be. <laughs> um, but one of the places where I am probably not cool is I, I feel like anything that starts with an I, again, any of those um, technologies that we have, they are, um, they are not a right, they are a privilege, is what I tell parents. And until someone is paying for the device and the data and everything that goes along with it, it is not theirs, and it is not theirs to have all to themselves. Uh, and I think, although these kids are, you know, much more advanced than we were at their age, they are not ready for the responsibility that comes with monitoring other people on social media. You know, there's we didn't even touch about it, but there's obviously a lot of very bad people on the other side of screens that are targeting kids and teenagers. Um, but even not even that, just the sheer amount of information that kids have access to is not healthy. And I think it is our job as parents and mentors to not just monitor that, but to control that. There's tons of apps out there that allow parents to monitor. Um, I mean, you can get text messages, all your kids' text messages and pictures sent to you. You can uh, put, um, what's the word? <laughs> You can block certain sites that they can go to, check what they're looking into, check their web histories to see what kind of information they're trying to access. Um, just because their friends are doing it does not mean that they should be doing it too. <laughs> the problem is, I know there's a lot of parents out there that just aren't as comfortable with social media themselves, although I think more are now mm -hmm. than, than my group of parents. Yep. But, um, and of course, we're all on Facebook where the kids right. have now left. Right. <laughs> so. Well, I think um, let, let me ask you this, so mm -hmm. start out with this. In your professional opinion, what, what is the age a person is really ready for a phone? I mean, you see, I see right. lots of really young kids with their own phones. It's true. I, I would say that it, it depends on your child. And especially as I'm saying this, I'm also thinking, you know, don't go home and just take everything away from your child. This needs to be um, communicated with your child. It's not punishment. It is a way to keep them safe, and that needs to be communicated with them. And you need to know what your child, where their emotional maturity level is, how trustworthy they are, how inquisitive they are, how sneaky they are. <laughs> um, and you need to make decisions based on what you think your kid can handle. Um, I would say, yeah, I don't know that there's a specific age. I think there are reasons that kids need phones. You know, they need to be able to access their parents and stuff throughout the day. But there are also, you know, different types of phones that don't have access to the internet. You know, so if your child needs to be able to call you, there are, there are ways to give them phones and communication devices that just allow phone calls or just allow texts. Um, I have some parents who their kids are not allowed to add anyone to their phone without permission, so they have to talk about why they want to add this friend or who that person is and, and things like that. So whatever you think you need to do so that you know who your kid is communicating with and what capacity. Um, and yeah, that's the, the safety thing. It is, is really, it really is. Issue. There are some bad people out there who are very savvy online and very tricky. Um, and I, you know, I do these presentations at schools all the time. I talk to kids and they know everything I'm saying. They know to change their passwords and to not hand them out and to not give identifying information. Um, but they are very vulnerable to sophisticated people who know how to ask the right questions to get information. So you answered my question, but didn't, in a sense. And is there an age, you think, or um, you're saying it's just so in individual? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, you're doing the politically correct thing, because I know right. all kids are different, and some are more mature than others. But to me, I mean, there's just the adolescent brain. It's so vulnerable right. and maturity levels and such. I mean, personally, I don't really see any reason for a child to have uh, their own phone in elementary school. Middle school things start to get a little bit more 
um, you know, where you're spending more time with different friends or maybe um, going home with a friend after school and things like that. Right. So, you know, I, I, that's probably the most common age where I see kids that they start to get them. I don't really know why a child would need one right. before that. And I didn't know there's ways you can block the internet and different oh, things. Yes. See, that tells you what I know. Yes. But um, yeah. I guess a lot of parents don't know this, though, too. Oh, parents don't. You know, I've had some parents, there's apps where you can have everything in your house turn off for a certain time every night. So if your kid is online while they're trying to do homework, you can turn all the internet off from five to eight. <laughs> I mean, there are so many things out there. You use the internet to find them. <laughs> and can that be one of the signs if you see you know, school um, school performance yes. start dropping off? Is it they're spending too much time on the phone and you can maybe use that as a bargaining chip of, hey, yes. you know, you can get your phone yes. and have more access once the grades are improved yes. or whatnot. It, I mean, it really should be a, a reinforcing tool. Again, not just something they automatically get. So there's really no reason for a kid to have their phone out while they're doing homework. It can be something that they earn, you know, I even do it with little kids. They get iPad time once all their chores and homework are done. Um, so it's a, it's a great tool to use to, to get things done, but you have to set limits. Right, and the reinforcement versus punishment, right. taking the, uh, versus right. taking something away. You get to earn time on it once you have accomplished all the other things you're supposed to get done. So what would then be some of the ways parents, it sounds like they should definitely monitor use, mm -hmm. um, institute some methods of control, especially if they're concerned mm -hmm. or see signs of right. depression, anxiety, being bullied, obviously, right. you know, that's a whole other matter. Um, so what is some of the proactive things they can do in terms of teaching or healthy ways to use technology? Right. So technology is not going away. You know, I talk to kids about it every day and probably once a week I am informed of something new that I didn't know about. Um, so parents have to be involved. They need to talk to their kids uh, as often as possible. They need to learn about what's new. And then they need to also be teaching their kids how to be kind online. Uh, just like we try to teach manners, please and thank you and hold a door, those are skills that we teach our kids, so we have to think about skills online also need to be taught, including, you know, when you post this picture and you only invited two of your friends and you know this person wasn't invited, how is that going to make them feel? Is this a picture you really need to post knowing that this person is going to have their feelings hurt? And if you want to post this picture, how do you talk to this friend to make sure they understand why you couldn't invite them this time? You know, we need to, kids need to be taught empathy and how to be kind to one another online. That's tough because adolescence is just fraught with all these issues. It's terrible. <laughs> Except it just wasn't out there. Right. right? But there was right. always issues where you felt excluded and your yeah. feelings were hurt right. and how did you work through that? Right. And, you know. and so it's just a whole new world. It is. Mm -hmm. So just what you post, how you post it, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know another thing you really wanted to talk about is uh, an organization or initiative you started mm -hmm. to kind of address some of these issues. Yes. It's called One Year to Empowerment. So mm -hmm. tell us about sure. that. Sure. It's about five years ago. So like I said, I've been practicing since 2012. And after a couple of years, I felt like I was spinning my wheels talking to these teenagers who were just online all day, feeling terrible about themselves. And I was trying to say, if you just put your phone down and get out and do something positive, see how that makes you feel. You know, go and volunteer or go do something physically active. Um, and they would come back and say, yeah, that feels okay, but you know, how do I do that all the time? So I came up with this idea of, it's called One Year to Empowerment. So it's a year-long program. Um, it started as for teenage girls in high school. We just started a middle school program this year uh, where we basically get girls together every month and we do some kind of empowering activity together. So some of it's community service. We'll build wheelchair ramps. We do 5Ks, um, the Women Supporting Women Walk, things like that. We've done aerial yoga. We learn how to change wow. a tire. We go to the local colleges and do tours. And we just talk about making positive decisions um, and how we can be kind to one another. So, you know, whenever you ask someone what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of a teenage girl, it's usually drama. And so we are teaching these girls how to be non-judgmental and just positive with one another. Because again, it's a skill that they, um, they're lacking, I think, because their world is just so 
fraught with social media and, and they're trying to keep up with everything that's going on. So we try to help them slow down and make positive choices together. So I guess no phones allowed during these activities or how do you well, handle that? Well, what happens <laughs> is they don't pick them up because what we're doing is so engaging, there's no reason. Um, so over the course of the year, you start to see where they don't bring their phones or their phones aren't as important anymore because they start to make the connection of when I'm online, I feel this way, but when I'm here with these girls and doing you know, even painting or something arts and crafts like, I feel better. And so the phones, um, they get used to look up inspirational quotes versus nice. monitoring what their friends are doing. Well, like I say, technology can be a very good thing it can be. in we terms just have of to access. Use it responsibly. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there's some basic tips. I mean, I know we've heard for years that at least no phones at the dinner table, mm -hmm. type of thing. Right. Um, so, are there any other like rules you think are good ideas for parents? Yeah, I mean, I think if you uh, well, <laughs> the very first rule is you have to model what you want your kids to do. <laughs> yes. And we as parents are just as likely to be like this at the dinner table or, I mean, how many times do you go out to eat and see a mom and their kid and they're both on their phones? <laughs> Instead Why would of they spending, know any yeah, different? Yeah, family right. time together. Right. Dinner yeah. is a great example. There's tons of research that shows just the um, positive aspects of sitting down at a dinner table and eating together, which families don't even really do anymore. Um, but certainly if you can put your phones away during then. Um, Phones, I always say, and technology needs to be put away at least an hour before bedtime because it takes, you know, your brain and the neurons and all of the firing at least that much time to, to quiet down so you can get a good night's sleep. And then if you can come up with a fun-filled day for your parents and this for your kids, this is the great time because we're embarking on summer. So have stuff planned where they're not, they don't even want to get online because you're going to go to the park today or you know, you've got some chores to do, we're gonna do some reading, we need to, um, we'll go do something fun, and then there's only a short window of time where they could even be online. Well, around here, just enjoy the beach and all the things yeah, there are so to do here to on do. the Eastern Shore, so. And I would say for teenagers, um, one of the biggest concerns I have for teenagers is a lot of time spent alone in their room. And it is okay to not allow that. And so again, you don't want it to be punishment. There needs to be alternative fun things to do so that they don't want to be in their room and withdrawn like that. At least with the door open. Yes. It's a big concern. Yes. <laughs> so much wonderful information and congratulations on your, your nonprofit. Oh, thank you. That sounds excellent Thanks. and a very proactive way to address the problem and help with the self-esteem issue. I think that's what a lot of this comes down it to. It does. It really does. Well, thanks again thank you. for thanks coming so back and being on the program on this important topic. Thanks. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Focus on Health here on PAC 14.